Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is the Debonair Ideal Series uh, segment that uh, Will and I are going to do here, sponsored by Debonair Cigars. Uh, do a, a very short little informational segment before we get into the our pipe segment uh, about how to cut and light a cigar like a gentleman. And I was thinking about this, you know, when we're talking to film and want to kind of do this little series on an ongoing basis about all things kind of debonair, um, dare I say lifestyle related. Um, but, you know, talk about different topics that maybe we haven't uh, visited in the Stoic Geek show in a while. Um, the first thing that came to mind when I when I thought of this segment, Will, when you and I were talking about it was, um, and I'm guilty of this as anyone when I'm smoking in my own, you know, comfort in my office or my home, is that when you cut a cigar, um, the make sure that the cap and, and everything that comes off the cigar after you cut it lands in the ashtray, right? I tend to be very sloppy about that sometimes when I'm in the comfort of my own home, but... Certainly when you're in uh, a public setting, you're at a nice lounge, you're enjoying a cigar after dinner in a very nice lounge setting, you're smoking your debonair cigar, or whatever cigar you're smoking, and you're in the, the presence of uh, uh, fellow cigar smokers, make sure that lands in the ashtray. There's no need to, to be making a mess with it um, as you're smoking. Um, and, and, and Will, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this, you know, in the lounge or, you know, guys are cutting and it's landing all over them. And sometimes there's bits of tobacco everywhere. Um, I always like to make sure that it lands in the ashtray when I'm in a, in a public setting. Yeah. You know, and that's, a, that's something probably I'm, I'm a little guilty of as well, you know, and when you make that cut, what I like to say is, you know, it's like cutting that thin deli meat. I like to say, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you're not going to you know, don't obviously, and I was guilty of this when I first started smoking. Is I take it and I I hunk a, I take a hunk off of it. You just really want to get that upper cap, and it's just a very thin, gentle cut where you want to kind of either catch it on the cutter and put it in the ashtray, or make sure it just lands in the ashtray. Yeah, like I've seen people that I've given cigars to, you know, just kind of hold her over the table and take way too much off the cigar, and there's like tobacco spraying everywhere. That's just not the way to do it. Um, yep. The other thing, too, that I think plays into kind of etiquette uh, along these lines is the way that you light a cigar. And you've heard us talk about it, and you've probably heard other, other shows and read articles about it as well, is that when you light a cigar, you know, people have a tendency sometimes to just stick their cigar, like, right inside of that flame. And that's not the way to do it. You don't want to, like, torch your cigar um, and they'll just stick the cigar right into the flame and call it lit and then put the lighter down. And, you know, there's just charred stuff flying everywhere. That's not the way to do it. I, I, I'm a firm believer in when you start your butane torch, um, you want to hold your cigar above the flame and not inside of the flame and, and give it a nice toast. And I think there's a very distinguished kind of characteristic about doing that, right? I mean, you're taking your time. Lighting the cigar, making sure the cigar is fully toasted without sticking it in the cigar, uh, the cigar inside of the flame. Uh, and then once that's done, lighting the cigar, putting it in your mouth and puffing on it while that flame is going. And n also, again, not putting it inside of the flame, holding it above the flame so that you're not torching and scorching your cigar uh, as you're lighting it. I think that's going to give you um, not just a better flavor experience, but I also think that's kind of a more gentleman's way of lighting a cigar rather than being impatient about it and and really scorching it will you know i i, I agree you know you, you want to when you start lighting it and you do that toasty you want to get a little lead on the wrapper so the wrapper is burning ahead of the filler and the binder mm. so you want to get a little bit of that to start but what you want to be careful is you don't want to get that that mascara line you don't want to blister that cigar and, right. and that's guilty if you start really putting the flame to it um and what i find is on ecuadorian connecticut's and Cameroon, especially with very delicate wrappers, um, it's more prone to that. So you want to take, I think you want to take that little extra care with wrappers like that because if you start getting those mascara lines, I think it it not only de degrades the smoking experience, but like I said, it's more of a sloppier smoke. It's yes. Gonna, you're yeah. Gonna get. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think that speaks to cigar etiquette. So yep. um, <clears throat> look for more in the series from the Debonair Ideal series where Will and I will be talking about. Um, of various topics on the topic of cigars, 
um, accessories and all kinds of different things that we're going to be doing on in the Debonair Ideal Series. So Yeah, we have some fun stuff planned, so stay tuned on that. Absolutely, and this series is sponsored, of course, by Debonair Cigars. And If you haven't tried the new Maduro line in Debonair, definitely go check that out. Oh, boy, uh, and they're smoking really good now. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I bet. Really co- yeah, they're aged I bet. nice. Debonair is a cigar I can go back to time and time again, and I'm just never, ever disappointed. Um, you know, I bought a box of those Salamones, and uh, I just I, I haven't smoked one out of that box yet, and I, I can't wait to dig into it as it's one of the <clears throat> early box dated cigars, and they are just fantastic, easy smoking, great flavors. So make sure you check them out. They're on uh, for sale at uh, Mr. J's Havana Smoke Shop. So make sure you look them up. Check it out. Alrighty, um, we're gonna do a segment on pipes. This is our first segment ever on pipes, and the way that this started. I'm just going to be brutally honest here, is I saw these really cool pipes from Drew Estate, and I'm going to hold this up for the camera. This is just, I thought this was the coolest looking pipe on the planet. Um, this is called the Robusto. They named the pipes after actual cigar sizes. Um, this is from their Tsugi line. Is that how you say it, Will? Sugi. Sugi line. The T is silent. Their Sugi line. Uh, of pipes. Will you just give us a little background on that? I think you caught up with them at IPCPR. Well, yeah, and, you know, obviously we know that, you know, the big news on Drew Estate, and we will hit that, but one thing is that Drew Estate earlier, prior to all the news about with Swisher, um, before IPCPR, they announced that they were entering into a distribution agreement with um, a pipe company out of Japan called Sugi. Um, and they're a well-known pipe maker, and um, they agreed to distribute um, some pipes. They, so they announced this distribution agreement. Um, to go one step further, though, is for the trade show, um, they actually came out with a pipe collection as well as a series of pipe tobaccos. And there's some stuff on Cigar Coop um, on that, and we I think we'll, we'll try to make sure we get that into the show notes. Um, where these are just some really innovative pipes. And if you're looking at what Paul has, right, the, the one thing that, that – again, you got to give Drew Estate credit, and this is why Swisher – I'll, I'll get to the Swisher stuff a little bit. This is why Swisher was looking at a couple of Drew Estate. Look at the innovation. You could set that pipe down on a table. Yeah, yeah, it definitely – I mean, how cool yeah. is that? I mean, that, that to me was awesome when I saw that. The other thing about uh, about this pipe, of course, this piece comes off right here. This black piece comes off so you can clean it. Um, I actually just cleaned it before this segment. I'm not going to show you how to pack it and light it. There's 8 well, on, million on segments. The, um, on Cigar Coop, the, there's a picture of the of it, though, in, taken apart. So yeah, you can see that um, as well. So this part comes off on the bottom. So this, this cap can go on the top or it can go on the bottom. And the trick when you use this pipe, and well, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, is you see how I put a little bit of pipe tobacco in the bottom there? There's a little ring in the bottom, a little right. um, hole to put some pipe tobacco. And when you're going to smoke it, you screw that into the bottom. And that little bit of pipe tobacco helps uh, cool off the smoke as it travels through the pipe. Um, so that, that's kind of a cool thing. And, and then if you want to save the pipe tobacco that's in the top, um, I can actually um, – I don't know what pipe tobacco that was in there in the, in the bottom, but – um, you can screw this part back on the top and uh, save some of your pipe tobacco for later and relight it, which is great. I, th- I thought that was a very unique feature of, the, of this pipe. Um, it's not, uh, you know, priced for everyone. It's very expensive. These are $250 each. Uh, again, I bought the Robusto uh, size in, in the pipe. And again, they're all named after, uh, you know, Bellicoso, Churchill and what have you. It's a very well-constructed pipe. Uh, I really like it. I don't have a point of comparison to compare it to other kinds of uh, pipes. Maybe I'll get a different pipe uh, in the future. Um, but I've really been liking uh, this pipe. Now, there are some... Again, I'm not going to show you how to pack it and light it and all that stuff. There's tons of segments online to show you how to do that. Um, we can cover that maybe in a later segment. I wanted to talk about the different kinds of pipe tobacco. Now... The first pipe tobacco, because this is kind of like a little cigar review, the first pipe tobacco that I, I bought was this Peterson Gold Blend, and this comes in a tin. Um, this is the number one selling pipe tobacco next door at the Havana Club. Um, this has some great flavor. Uh, in fact, when you smell it, the uh, aroma is very, very pleasant from, from this tobacco. 
Uh, again, this is a Peterson Gold blend. Um, I, I found, though, out of all the different pipe tobaccos that I tried, that the Peterson Gold blend was, I think, the most difficult to stay lit. Um, after a little bit more practice, I smoked some earlier before the show. Um, I was able to keep it lit a little better, and um, I got some more of those flavors out of it. Um, probably the harshest of the of the bunch that I smoked. Not to say that it was harsh by any stretch, but it burns a little hotter than some of the other pipe tobaccos that I tried. So um, that's the Peterson Gold blend. And, you know, again, it comes in a tin. And, you know, make sure you keep this tin humidified, too, as it'll dry out if you don't once you break the seal on the tin. So it's kind of like... I'm not going to compare it to a bundled cigar, but it's probably on the lower end of the spectrum as terms of pipe tobacco go for me. Um, now, the other one that I, I tried, um, this one, in fact, I got to look this one up on my phone. Um, that w- This next one comes from Mr. J's uh, Havana Smoke Shop, and it is, in fact, their number one selling pipe tobacco. So I went to three different shops here locally, bought their number one selling pipe tobacco, um, I didn't write in the bag what this one was, but I have it here on my phone. So I, I was talking to Stogie Santa, um, who's been selling pipe tobacco from Mr. J's for a long time. They've got a, a pretty good uh, following there. And this is called Golden Cavendish. It's $3.59 an ounce. Um, and I smoked two or three you know, bowls full of this, and, and this is about how much that that I have left. It's kind of hard to see on camera with the black background. Let me hold my hand up in front of it. So I've got about that much left of it. So an ounce, you know, really goes a long way with pipe tobacco. Uh, compared to cigars, very economical, right? Four bucks and uh, you get three or four more bowlfuls full of the um, pipe tobacco. Uh, Golden Cavendish. And this pipe tobacco was really good. Um, it burned a lot better than my Peterson Gold Blend. Um, and some of the other blends that I tried. And uh, the flavor was a little good. It had a little more punch to it than some of the other blends. Uh, And overall, I really, really liked it. I wish it burned a little better. I found that this one was interesting in that, similar to a cigar, it took a little while to get started. Like, you know, I'd pack a bowl in the pipe, and then um, I, you know, get through kind of like the first third. And then all of a sudden, it starts smoking really great, and I got some great flavors from it. So... Um, again, this is uh, from Mr. J's on a smoke shop. It is their number one selling pipe tobacco. Now, um, I'm going to save the best for, for last. Um, this one right here is Blackberry pipe tobacco. This was gifted to me by production assistant Nick. Uh, and I was in a very experimental mood today. So I figured I'd give it a, a try. Now, when you smell this tobacco, Will, it smells like blackberry bubblegum oh it smells just like bubblegum like i i came to kick ass and chew bubblegum and i'm all out of bubblegum this is just all about bubblegum and i was very skeptical to even put this in my pipe because i'm not a big fan of flavored tobacco in any sense of the imagination um however when i smoked it that blackberry flavor was not overpowering it did not taste like bubblegum it was very much in the background, um, and it had more of a tobacco flavor than I thought, and I really liked it. Um, it burned probably very similar to the one that I got at Mr. J's. They had about the same about you know the kind of combustion rate, and I found that different pipe tobaccos you know burn better than others, um, and those two were kind of on par. Both burned a lot better than my Peterson Gold, um, but again, the the blackberry flavor. Um, it kind of makes me want to try a couple other different kinds of flavors because it really, it wasn't that bad. I think I was explaining in the chat room before that, um, I would probably rather smoke this from the pipe in the blackberry flavor than some of the fire cured tobacco cigars that are out there because it was much less pungent on my palate. Um, so that's that one. Now, as far as my top Pipe tobacco. And now, it, the production assistant Nick is in there shaking his head because him and I have tried both together all of the tobacco that I've talked about. Nick's uh, getting into the pipe as well. So it was nice to have someone to, to bounce ideas off of. And we're, I think we're very much on the same page. We're certainly on the same page as to which one is our favorite. 
Um, I went to the humidor and I, I spoke to my good friend Jana, um, whose family has owned uh, the humidor smoke shop here in Rhode Island uh, since the 70s. And I said, well, what am I looking at with pipe tobacco? She's like, well, what do you like? I said, well, I, you know, I tried some Peterson Gold and it was kind of okay. And she's like, you smoked it out of the tin? Really? She's like, that's not like you come in here and buy Davidoff. Like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, so what, am I, what, what do I want, Jana? She's like, okay. She's like, our best-selling pipe tobacco. They mix. They either mix or blend themselves. I'm going to try and bring Jana on the show for everyone to talk about cigars and pipes and you know, all the things they're doing in their, their store. Again, a lot of family history there. Um, one of the nicest families. Um, I went to school with their kids and everything like that. Um, so she said our number one pipe tobacco is called Yellow Jacket. She said, we've mixed it ourselves for over 20 years, <laughs> and it outsells our second best-selling pipe tobacco by three or four times. <laughs> I'm like, I, w- I want an ounce of that. And it just, it's, oh, it just, it smells wonderful. It's a lot milder than the other pipe tobaccos that I've tried. It's got a much mi- more mild um, strength profile to it. However, it burns the best out of any of the other pipe tobaccos. And I think that's one of the things, the combustion rate on this pipe tobacco was definitely the best. And um, for that, it's it's my number one, my number one favorite uh, out of all the ones that I've tried. And um, it, it, it works great inside this pipe. It stays lit longer than any of the other ones. It doesn't burn hot. Um, so if you're just, uh, the, the moral of the story is, if you don't live here in Rhode Island and have access to these pipe tobaccos, a couple of morals to the story. If you're just getting into pipes, my recommendation, go to your local tobacconist that sells pipe tobacco. Ask them what they recommend and get some of the pipe tobaccos that they either mix or blend themselves. Um, so some will take you know different ones from different manufacturers and mix them together. Some will actually blend them together and you know have their own blend of pipe, pipe tobacco. Um, Try some of those. Number two, the different pipe tobaccos, if you're frustrated at first like I was trying to keep a pipe lit or when you try and light it too much and it gets really hard and it start, it's hot and it starts to taste harsh, um, try some of those other blends because they're all going to have a different combustion rate um, and you might have better success depending on your pipe and depending on what tobacco you put in it. So don't be afraid to experiment. The nice part is pipe tobacco is a lot less expensive than cigars. Um, now to the question, is it a replacement for a cigar or a supplement? Um, to me, it's, I mean, it's no replacement for a cigar. I, I would much, much, much rather have a cigar than have a pipe. The advantage of the pipe though, is you can go outside for 20 minutes or so when it's really, really cold out, smoke your pipe for a little while, uh, and then come back inside where it's warm. So when winter time coming up, if you haven't tried a pipe, you don't have to go out and buy a really expensive pipe like I did. Um, you know, well, how much was the pipe that you had, Nick? Yeah, uh, Nick bought a pipe for about twelve dollars. It's a wooden. What's that? It's one twelve. Well, that's way more expensive than I thought. So that's a hundred and twelve dollars for a wooden pipe. But you can get pipes of all different shapes, sizes, and prices. Um, Nick, you bought a Peterson pipe. Uh, there's also a Nording. Nording makes very nice, beautiful is it, pipes. Is it by Nord? Eric, I met Eric Nording. I met Eric Nording. He was in Joyles one day. He's like the nicest guy on the planet. He was awesome. I watched. I watched. He's you know he's from Denmark, and I yeah. watched the women's Danish curling with him, and we were having a. It was very mm. interesting. <laughs> super super nice guy. He makes a fantastic line of pipes as well. He's, um, he's a knowledgeable guy too. Yeah, and, very, and you, oh, yeah. You know, as uh, uh, Ed Whedon says in the chat, pipes are very inexpensive. You can start off with an inexpensive pipe. They have um, Doc Gray bows for 20 bucks. I mean, I'm not saying that's a, a great pipe, but it's a good starter pipe um, as opposed to like a cheap corn cob. You get a Doc Gray bow for like about 20 bucks. Right, right. Um, and like I said, with winter coming up, uh, you can find some really cool pipe tobacco at your local tobacconist um, like I did. You know, I visited the three shops that were close to me, and I got a wide range of pipe tobacco, and uh, it doesn't break the bank to experiment either. You know, all in total... I maybe spent thirty or forty dollars uh, on pipe tobacco, and I still—I mean, I have a ton left uh, to smoke. Um, and uh, you know, I smoke smoke it all the time. I smoked a lot of it today in preparation for this segment, uh, and really started getting the hang of 
how to pack it. So don't be put off at first. You know, when you pack the pipe, there's a certain way to do it. Um, you know, essentially you drop some tobacco in, you pack it down with your finger, drop some more in, tamp it down. Um, how are we doing on time? We, we're good on time. All right, I'm going to talk about the, the very inexpensive 20 maybe maybe $20 uh, pipe lighter, which I strongly recommend that people buy. You don't necessarily need this accessory. I found it to be very helpful. It's a nice soft flame um, on an angle, so you can get in there and light your pipe, which is great. It comes with three different tools, and I'll explain what the three different tools do. So one is the one you use most often, and that's the tamp. It's got a flat end on it, and you use that to, to pack your pipe and tamp it down. Um, so essentially, you want to. it's like a three-stage process, right? You fill it up, push the tobacco down, fill it up again, push the tobacco down, fill it up, push the tobacco down again. Then you light it for the first time, and then you tamp it down. And that's where the tamp comes in, in handy because you don't want to touch the hot, obviously, tobacco. And you tamp it down, and then you light it, light it again for a second time, and that's where it's supposed to get going and, and burn without you having to light it too many times after that. I end up having to light it a lot more because I, I suck at it, basically. Um, but that's, that's, it's a great thing to have that rate on your lighter. They also sell tamps and tools that are separate. They're like $3 to buy a pipe tool um, that will help you tamp it down. It's also got um, like the equivalent in the cigar world of a draw poker. So if you happen to put like Nick happened to, before the, when he was doing the other show, put a little too much pipe tobacco in there and it wasn't drawn right. So you can get this tool and poke it in there. And basically it's a draw poker for your pipe, um, which is like self-inflicted Paul syndrome. For those that listen to the show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the other tool is like a little scraper that you get with it. And this little scraper, you know, after you empty it out, it can kind of scrape some of that out. You don't want to scrape it too much. There's something to be said for the cake that builds up inside of your pipe that adds to the sweetness flavor of your pipe. But you do want to scrape some of the stuff out there very gently uh, every once in a while. I'm not the world's most foremost pipe expert, but that's, that's kind of what I learned. Um, this is a, a Lotus Vertigo pipe lighter, and I want to say it was around twenty dollars with the, the for the lighter and all the tools, and it fills up with butane just like all your other cigar lighters. So I think it was a very worthwhile uh, investment. I also find matches work really well too. You light a wooden match and you put it over the top, and it can kind of it kind of creates a nice even flame over the top of the cigar. Matches are perfectly acceptable as well, and sometimes work better uh, or just as good as the lighter. So. Will, have you tried a pipe before? Oh, yeah. I've, I've tried the pipe before. And, um, you know, I like the pipe a lot of times when this time of the year in North Carolina, I can maybe in, maybe a couple months from now, November, early December, those mornings where it's about, in the, it gets into the 40s. And, mm. it, and I find it's really nice to kind of go out in that 40-degree weather. And, and there's something about the pipe there. Um, I think it's important about the pipe lighter. Um do not try to use your regular cigar lighter. Yeah, yeah, don't use your torch. I'll tell you, um, because first of all, you, you can't sometimes angle them into the pipe um, because they won't. The, the lighter won't light at times, and if you angle it a certain way, you can end up scorching the pipe, which you don't want to do either. Um, so the the other thing I thought that was real important with the pipe, Paul, did you have to go through a seasoning process to kind of, you know, with your new pipe, yeah. go through a process with it's, that? It's a good point. I think the wooden pipes, you have to go through a seasoning process so you don't burn too much of the wood that's, because it, 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 a lot of the pipes are wooden. Mm -hmm. um, this pipe from Drew Estate, uh, the Sugi, has like a coating already inside of it. And there is kind of a seasoning process that is taking place, but I, I didn't think it was as important. Maybe I'm wrong um, to season this pipe. So, okay, no, that's good to know. But if you are going with the wooden ones, I, I I do know you want you want to do that. I think um, Nick was saying you the wooden ones they recommend you fill up about halfway. You don't pack it fully all the time, and you do that about twenty times. The first twenty times you smoke it, you fill it up halfway to build up some of that cake inside of the wooden yep. ones. Yep. I mean, uh, and pipe cleaners are very important. You yes. want to keep that shaft clean. It's you know you get the pipe you get a pipe cleaner. It's really easy. Um, very important to keep your shaft clean. Yeah, keep your shaft clean. Um, you, you really do because uh, if it's not clean, it you're going to get all that tar and it will get yeah. very bitter. Uh, and pipe cleaners are like $2. Uh, yeah. Very inexpensive. Like I said, I gave my, I gave my, my shaft a thorough cleaning before the show. Yep. Um, very important to do so. Um, 
yeah, you don't you want that that build up happening. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, don't o- yeah, don't overfill your pipes. My other, um, I burnt a lot of shirts. <laughs> with pipes, yeah, um, I did too. Cigars. Yeah, like the embers will just come flying out of the pipe, and you know me yeah. with ashing on myself. Yeah. Now I get embers from the pipe, and my clothes stand no chance when I'm smoking a pipe, let alone a cigar. So yeah. I need to. We have uh, we have pipe events down in North Carolina. I, not as much as cigar events, but I found that they take great way to uh, learn and educate. Um, usually they'll they'll have intro, you know introduct. Some of them will even give you an introductory pipe at the event, but they'll they'll expose you to the tobaccos and they'll give you some best practices. You know, on top of what we've talked about. Um, and they'll usually give you some good deals. Um, if there's a big pipe maker like a Nording or, or a Stokerby in town, um, you know you can get you can get a good deal on those as well. So um, you know, take advantage of you know, go to your local tobacconist because a lot of them will do pipe stuff several times a year. Um, and if not, you know, ask them to do it. You know, if there's enough demand, they'll certainly bring it, bring someone in. Yeah, I I encourage uh, you know cigar smokers. You'll you'll probably really like the pipe. The thing. That we haven't mentioned yet is a pipe. It's kind of a pain in the ass compared to cigars. It's a pain in the ass, dude. Like there's cleaning involved. There's packing. You have to carry the pipe and the tobacco with you, as well as you know a tamp, and as well as like matches or a lighter if you have it all in one. So there's there's a lot going on when it comes to a pipe, and it's kind of a pain in the ass. You have to keep relighting it usually um so it's not like a cigar where i can throw a cigar in my pocket make sure i have a cutter and a lighter in my other pocket and i'm kind of good to go there's a lot more kind of moving parts um to the pipe which i think kind of puts people off uh to it so um it's got that you know kind of that's a con you know the the pros are it's nice to be able to pack a pipe go outside and smoke for 20 minutes um, you know, during halftime in a football game, come back in and then maybe go out a little later, um, especially with these Drew Estate ones where you can, you know, put the, the cap on the top. Um, that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, so. no, I agree. Um, the other thing I would say is um, my experience with the pipe is winter could be tough on your pipe tobacco because um, you don't want that to dry out. Mm. So, you know, you want to make sure you're, um, you're storing that in, in an airtight container. And don't store it in your humidor with your cigars is no, my recommendation. No. Pipe tobacco has a very, very pungent aroma. In fact, uh, I think Nick was saying this blackberry tobacco that he got, like his whole his whole house smelled like blackberries, dude. Yeah. <laughs> he woke no, up in have, the morning. He's like, been, all I can taste is blackberries. And put them into pipe tobacco to see what the infusion would do, and it will infuse it. Um, yeah, it will. Have some cheap bundle cigars, sometimes... And you know, you know you're not going to smoke them. Give it a shot. It may I see. Yeah, it may it actually make them better. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I've been keeping mine in a lot of Ziploc bags to keep them airtight. And then I put them in a travel humidor. I've got this little travel humidor here, uh, which has a bead system, which uh, basically now, yeah, if I smell it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put cigars back in this one. I think I'm kind of designating this small little travel humidor for my pipe tobacco and I keep yep. the bead system in there to keep a, a relative hum- humidity. Um, and this one is pretty much just dedicated for, for pipe tobacco at this point. It's a great point. Will. yep. um, are you ready for some technology? Some, some people may see this thing sitting next to me here. Um, this is a, a PAX vapor. Now you all know, I love the vape stuff. And we did a vape segment, which was, uh, was very, well received actually um and i couldn't resist buying this device it's from a a company called plume uh and they make a pax system and this is actually for pipe tobacco um so what you do uh is you uh open up this bottom container here and inside of the bottom i don't know if you can see that uh i don't know if we can get that on camera but there's a, a what they call an oven in the bottom of this battery operated device which you have to charge and inside of the bottom of the oven, you put your pipe tobacco, okay? So you pack this full of pipe tobacco, very similar to the way you would pack a pipe. And then when you push this, uh, when you push this button up, I don't know if we can get that closer on camera. We switch to the other camera. You push this button up, 
and you'll see in the packs that that little light is glowing there, that means it's heating up. One of the things I, I don't like about this system is it does take some time to heat up. So you can still it's still it's still heating up. But it's very much a vapor system. So once it once it heats up to the uh, the appropriate temperature, this light will turn green. And essentially what it does is by heating up the pipe tobacco, it's pulling off the oils and the vape and the moisture rather, oils and moisture, turning it into vapor, and you basically smoke the, the top of it like you would your pipe. And you get the vapor from your pipe tobacco. You can smoke this inside, which is a great plus for this one. It doesn't leave a residual odor, just like another the vapes I talked about on the previous show. However, the flavors are just like you're smoking a pipe. So you don't have to deal with the uh, e-liquids, as they call them, that come in your e-cigarettes or vapes um, that all of us are kind of skeptical about, like, what do they put in these e-liquids? This is just pipe tobacco that you're putting in here. Um, so you're smoking tobacco like you would at a pipe or a cigar, except you're putting it in your vaporizer. You can see it's turned green, so let's see. Yeah, and I actually have the blackberry uh, tobacco uh, inside of this. You can see the light has turned green, telling me that it's okay to, to, to smoke that. And there's three different temperature settings on this particular device. Uh, low, medium, and high. I have it on the medium setting now, which I tend to like the best. Um, my one, my one of the other complaints I have with this one, I don't get a whole lot of smoke. You don't get as much smoke as when you smoke a pipe or a cigar. You get a, a, a lot, I mean, not a tiny bit of smoke, but you get less smoke than you would from a cigar or a pipe. It's probably my major complaint with this one. Although it is kind of nice because if I want to smoke this inside and I don't want the house to smell and my wife to complain, um, I can use this particular device. Now, I bought this from a major online cigar retailer. The suggested retail price is $250. I think I paid $236 and I had a coupon for free shipping. Um, personally, I think that price is a little high, although it is growing on me uh, as something I will use as... If you're in a situation where you don't want your car to smell, you don't want your house to smell, and you listen to our, our vape segment and you're like, I, that's not for me. I don't like the flavors. Paul said there was no really good tobacco flavors. But you enjoy the flavors you get from a pipe. This device may be for you, um, and I'm liking it so far. Now, the other thing is you have to charge this device, um, and it has to run off of a battery. Um, if you do leave it on, like if I wanted to turn it off, I'd push that down and it would turn off. If you do leave it on like this, it will turn off on its own. It does get very warm. If you feel the bottom, it's almost too hot to touch on the bottom. So you want to hold it around the, the green or whatever color. You, I got the green one. They have black ones as, as well. Um, it's built as a compact portable vaporizer. Um, it's very simple to use. Uh, it is very simple to use. They're all cleaning instructions. I haven't had to clean it yet. Um, but there are cleaning instructions for it. I think that the plus side for cigar smokers who listen to this show is that this tastes just like pipe tobacco. And if you like smoking tobacco like cigars or pipes and you're scared to get into the whole vape thing, this one may be for you. Um, so, I mean, I, I really like it, Will. I, I don't know what you... What, yeah, no, what I'm do you very think? interested in this, actually. I wanna, when I come up there, I definitely want to see this in action firsthand yeah i i i really am digging it this. seems cleaner it seems like a cleaner way too it is a much cleaner way um like i said i haven't had to clean it yet um the downside is you do have to charge it right just like you have to clean your pipe i mean you, you have to charge this and clean it so there's a little bit of maintenance um that goes into it but i i'm really liking it i like i said i think for right now i think $236 is a little too high for this device. I'd like to see these come down in price um, just a little bit. Um, this one is staying charged um, quite a bit. Sometimes it um, it cools itself down and you have to kind of wait before you can uh, take a puff on it, which is kind of annoying. Uh, if you put it on the high setting, it goes through the battery much quicker and it takes a lot longer to kind of recharge the temperature. Um, you don't get to put a whole lot of pipe tobacco in it as well. And you'll notice when you take the pipe tobacco out, the pipe tobacco is very dry as it, again, is sucking all that oils and moisture out of the pipe tobacco, 
which is kind of cool. I wish that the oven was a little bigger on it so I could put a little more pipe tobacco in it. Um, so it has pros and cons. You know, I, I, I don't. that's kind of my assessment of it. Um, overall, I'm pretty happy with my purchase. I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad I bought it, and I, I do plan on using it. Um, I have to say that probably over this, I do prefer smoking the uh, from my Sugi pipe much better. Primarily because I find I get a little more flavor when the tobacco is actually burning and combusting. Uh, and I get a lot more smoke, which is a lot more satisfying for me um, when, it, when I do the, the pipe tobacco. Again, either of these things that I've reviewed out of all the hundreds and hundreds of cigars I reviewed in the show, it's again, it goes up there with the vape as no replacement for a cigar. So, I mean, if you're content, content smoking cigars, let me be your guinea pig and say, <laughs> go with the cigar. Um, you know, I'm smoking the uh, – what's the new Fuente Añejo size here? The 888. The 888. Thank you, Will. I'm smoking the 888, and it's absolutely fabulous. And neither of these things, to me, are uh, a, a substitute for a good premium handmade cigar. So uh, I wanted to make sure our listeners had that information and include that in our pipe segment. So um, although this, this PAX device is pretty cool. I tell you what, I'm going to Las Vegas uh, for a conference this weekend. And I'm definitely taking this with me. Um, I'm, I may not have the opportunity to go to a cigar lounge out there. My friends may want to go to dinner. Um, and there's nothing to say I can't use this at dinner. Uh, you know, after I, I finish dinner and have some pipe tobacco put in there and, um, and, and enjoy some tobacco flavors after dinner, uh, there's something to be said for that without having to go seek out a, a cigar lounge. So Exactly, yeah. Um, Will, I don't know if you have thoughts or comments on, on everything I've presented. No, I mean, that's a, you know, we, we, we try to present, obviously, create awareness with this. Um, this intrigues me a lot. Um, the price point, I admit, it's a little high, but it's something that very much intrigues me, um, you know, in terms of the technology there. And I'm wondering if there's going to be, if this is something, you know, as, the, as this segment of the market grows, you know, we may start seeing some lower priced options, certainly. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, like, the fact that you can put real tobacco in it. Yeah. That, that, it, that, that, that's the part that when you were telling me about this earlier, I'm like, wow, that's because my big thing on the vapes, it's, it's not real tobacco, but this is right. real tobacco you're putting in there as well. Yeah. And I knew that if that appealed to you, Will, I knew it would appeal to our listeners as <laughs> yeah. well, um, because I know you were kind of like, I want to try the vape thing, but it's not tobacco. So I'm not interested. And that's why when I saw this, I, I wanted to try it. Um, as a lot of times I'm traveling and I'm in situations where I, I, I can't necessarily enjoy a cigar. And like I said, I go out with my friends and they're not into cigars. So I end up in places where I can't have a cigar. Um, but I do want to smoke something and, and, and have that. And, um, while the vape thing is, is nice, I'm telling you the flavor. Now I smoked the pipe a lot and I've smoked this new PAX vaporizer, um, Quite a bit. I mean, a little bit. I got it in actually uh, yesterday, the day before, and I've tried to smoke it as much as I can. And I tell you what, the flavors are spot on. The flavors are spot on, which really amazed me. Um, I mean, you are putting pipe tobacco in it, but the, the just that the flavors are so close to um, the the pipe tobacco and that whole experience really, really amazed me. So. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm the one. I'm the one who, I guess, I romanticize a lot about tobacco, whether it's pipe tobacco or cigar tobacco. This is something, like I said, intrigues me because I can still romanticize about the tobacco aspect of it, and then take yeah. advantage of some technology there. Which I, that that's the part that really intrigued me. Yeah, and I put uh, a few different types of the pipe tobacco in there. I actually haven't tried the yellow jacket, which was my favorite pipe tobacco in this vaporizer. I'm wondering if I'll get more. Uh, vapor from the yellow jacket as that releases the most amount of smoke when I put it in my pipe. So, um, you know, maybe I'll report back on a later segment. We'll do maybe some more segments on pipes. I think our listeners were a lot more receptive to um, segments on pipes than they were of anything else that deviates from cigars. So, Right. I can understand. The big test will be if Stogie Santa tries this. Yeah. It's ex- love to see that day. <laughs> We may have to report on. We may have to. We may yeah. have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um. So, Will, let's uh, as as we kind of close it out here, let's talk a little bit about uh, the recent acquisition of uh, Drew Estate, and this was uh, a complete acquisition by Swisher of Drew Estate. So they're now a 
or soon to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Swisher, correct? Yeah, so, I mean, the difference that people need to understand about this acquisition as opposed to the Taranio and Lasia ones, this was a Swisher bought Drew, is, is, or they announced their intent to acquire Drew Estate. So the transaction is not finalized, but it's pretty much they're announcing it, so it's probably a matter of just time at this point. But they've acquired the entire company. So it's not just brands. They've acquired the brands, the Drew Estate factory, um, all the resources, uh, their warehouses, and the people. So this is this is a this is a corporate acquisition that's happened here. And even though Drew Estate's a privately held company with a lot of different partners, it this is an acquisition. I, I, you know, and there's a lot that's been said about this because it is Swisher. Okay, and you know the, the, the one thing that was interesting with this is, you know, when rumors start, right? Instead of me dwelling on the rumors, I was able to kind of really look into things a little more and kind of analyze this ahead of time. Um, knowing it, we, we kind of knew it was coming, um, although we weren't sure it was coming. But, you know, the interesting thing that I saw, that, that and I guess this would happen, is they made them, like you said, Paul, it's a subsidiary. And so, the, so what they've done is they've essentially, for now, preserved Drew Estate kind of as a company. But now there's this parent company of Swisher. Um, my feeling, and, and you know, they're saying this is going to protect all the jobs, which it's going to probably protect most people's jobs, including the management level jobs. My gut, and I've been through this in terms of seeing corporate acquisitions. I've been on both ends of them. The first year, I think you'll see, you're not going to see a big change with Drew Estate. Um, I, think the se- I think as time goes on and you get into that second year, that's when the parent company is going to start streamlining things, you know, where they start putting in their own processes, you know, in in terms of the day-to-day activities, you know, it could be anything from, you know, putting in a new expense reporting system um, to the types of reports that are needed for management, Um, you know, the budgetary, you know, the budgets and those things. That's when I think you'll start to see some changes happen. And then I think you'll see some attrition happen with that. But I don't think we're going to see an immediate impact um, right out of the gate with this. I just I think you'll see for the rest of the, at least this year, it's going to be business as usual. Um, the, in terms of um, Jonathan Drew is staying on, uh, as well as co-founder Marvin Samwell and, and President Michael Salucci, they weren't really clear what their roles are going to be. Um, I'm, my gut's telling me that Jonathan's going to move into, at least for the short term, I think he's going to be I think he'll still be involved somewhat with the factory. He's, he's still kind of involved with the Uzi brand. But I think he's going to become more of this Avo type of guy in terms of this. He's going to become the face of that, that Drew Estate. You know, like he already is, but I think he'll continue with that. Yeah, um, you said something interesting about the marketing, uh, Will, of Drew Estate, how uh, the marketing of premium handmade cigars um, into Swisher and some of that integration between the two. Yeah, you know, so it's really, there was really, this is again, I was able to kind of really look at the history of Swisher, and it's, and if we had a lot of time, we could actually do a whole segment on that, but Mm. there is some stuff I put on Cigar Coop. They've been in the premium space before. Um, In fact, they were, they've been involved with factories before. Um, Well, Alex Alex Goldman, who we interviewed on the show, right, is, um, was leading their premium line with the, uh, the Kismet and the Royal Gold and all those lines. Yeah, so Alex, it was. So here's the thing: when they got, they used to have a factory like Manuel Casada. They were partners with for a while. They got out of the business, and then they launched Royal Gold last year. and They brought Alex in, and if you remember when Alex was on the show, the strategy they were were doing was kind of like boutique-ish. They were okay. We're going to find factories to make our blends, um, but I don't think they were looking to be a boutique company. I think that what they were looking to do is they were looking to. Uh, you know, contract out with these companies, but I think they wanted to do volume. I mean, this is Swisher we're talking about. It's not. Yeah. It's not a uh, a viaje here. But I think what's happened is, um, th- those blends have not made it into the brick and mortars. Mm. You don't see them in a lot of brick and mortars, right? Um, I think there were a couple of problems with that. I think the biggest problem was they did. You know, Swisher's sales force wasn't geared at the brick and mortars. They're geared more at the convenience stores and the catalogs. So I think they had a tough time making that penetration. With Drew Estate now, they got a ready-made sales force and they got an innovative marketing team. Yeah. Um, I did converse with Alex this week, um, and Alex told me 
Um, you know, because I kind of asked, well, what's going to be the role of Royal Gold and Drew Estate going forward? He said that by early next year, the plan is that Royal Gold is probably going to be something that's going to be start to be sold with the Drew Estate sales force. So now, you know, they'll be able to leverage that. And I think there's a lot of talent in that sales force and that marketing team. Mm-hmm. That maybe Swisher, like I said, they they were not. They have a very different focus. That they're going to be able, they're going to be able to take advantage of that. Um, they, you know, as far as the they, what they did say is they're not going to try to sell this stuff in the convenience stores. Um, they may take a couple, some of the Drew Estate products, like some of the acid, which are available in convenience packs, and those may go into there. Um, I'm, I don't know what the future is going to be for Royal Gold. Um, I would imagine there's going to be some integration where there's going to be a Swisher Premium division, and I would guess with that whole thing, it's going to be around the, the Drew Estate model. You know, Drew Estate, they got the factories, you know, so I don't know if they're going to continue to make Kismet and Casino Gold HRS and, and these other fa- or factories. They were, Drew Estate was already making the Nirvana for them. I almost think that was like a trial run now that I think about it, you know, that they had an opportunity there. So, you know, now they, they've got a huge factory right now. Now, Paul, this was the big thing I heard all week. You know, well, here's the thing. If uh, they're going to ruin all the products, okay, we don't know that, okay? I'm so, I mean, you know, look, look, I mean, there's, I guess there's some precedent with other acquisitions in cigar industries. We don't know it. Um, it, can it happen? Yes, can it happen? You know, I can see it one way or another. The one thing that I think w- what it's not going to solve is what like, good example is Liga Pravada. So Liga Pravada is constantly the biggest problem is Liga Pravada's demand. They, they can't keep up with the demand on that. This acquisition is not going to solve that problem. No. So because why? Yes, they have all these resources, but there's still finite amount of tobacco that goes into that. Right. If that problem suddenly gets solved, then that's going to raise a flag to me. So yeah. how come all of a sudden they can they can satisfy all these accounts? So that that's where I would you know until that happens, I'm going to reserve judgment on that. Well, you know, I think we need to look at it as a positive thing for Drew Estate. I'm happy for them. You know, I, I think it's a great move for them. I think that uh, merging with Swisher is is a good thing for them. I think that people kind of had this um, preconceived notions that oh well, you know. Drew Estate's going to turn into the Dutch masters of the world because Swisher bought them and all that stuff. Look, be happy for Drew Estate. This is a good move for them. Um, you know, they got bought. In, in, you know, in the computer security field that I'm in, <coughs> most often this is a positive thing when your company gets bought. Um, there can be some negative connotations associated with it, as you said, Will. Sometimes they try and change the brand. Sometimes they try and cut the workforce. Um, but I think my assessment of this overall is that I'm happy for Drew Estate. I think it's a great move for them. Um, I, I think that they're a great company making great products. Um, you know, I look forward to the cigars they come out with. There are some Drew Estate cigars that are very high up my list. In fact, you know, recently, as we said, the Liga Provada T52 Toro was a, an Oasis level cigar for me, which we don't just hand out to anyone. Um, companies have to earn that with the. Um, with their products and the quality of their products, and certainly that that cigar earned it very much so. Their Unico series makes some of my most favorite cigars in terms of the UF13 and the the Dirty Rat and the L40 Lancero, um, all great cigars. I think that um, it's interesting um, along the lines of pipe tobacco on my short list of pipe tobacco to try uh, are the ones from Drew Estate. There's also some of the ones from Davidoff as well. Um, I don't know if Davidoff is still making pipe tobacco or not, but um, certainly the getting back to Drew Estate, their pipe tobacco is on my list of, of things to try as well. And let's face it, their marketing has been fantastic, and I think that was one of the differentiators for them in the market um, and one of the reasons why Swisher would want to buy them is for their marketing team. And you know, I um, work in marketing now as part of my day job, and... Uh, I look at Drew Estate's marketing, and, and they've done a fantastic job. I mean, I- above and beyond fantastic. Their marketing is great. Um, and uh, a lot of their products live up to that marketing too, which is a, a difficult combination to have. So um, I look at this as a very positive thing, and I just wanted to throw that out there that I, you know, I, I think there's been some negative connotations as a, some of these acquisitions that have happened. But 
um, be happy for the people that are, 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 are moving and shaking in this industry and, and doing things like this. The key thing is going to be this, besides the products, and the products are going to be important. Jewish State's established this culture and this connection to its consumer base mm. through, its, through, its, through the people, um, from Jonathan Drew down to their sales force. If that changes, yeah, um, where, you know, Jonathan Drew would preach, let's do it together, DE for life. And, I'll, you know, I'll be straight, you know, Jonathan handled the denial of this very poorly. Mm. Okay, and there's no question about that. And I think, I, you know, it's, it could have been handled better. I don't know what else he could have done because corporate acquisitions are very sensitive. Okay, but I think in, in hindsight, when the rumors got out, uh, you know, hey, look, they should have been, first of all, more careful who, who was in that inner circle because obviously something leaked out from the inner circle. Um, but the second thing is, you know, in terms of the denial, I think it was, you know, they have such a loyal consumer base, a lot of consumers. You know, bat, you know, they basically defended Drew Estate saying, no, Drew Estate's not going to sell out. Johnson's saying it's not true. Well, it, it changed. So I think they have some damage control to do that right now. And it's, it's, it's in my opinion, it's fixable. Um, it's not something that, that's not fixable. But from a cigar people's, from a cigar standpoint, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm actually, look, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the road ahead for this too. And I'll say another thing. Drew Estate, look, they were public. They had debt. They couldn't continue. You can't continue operating at the level they're operating in debt. You yeah, know? but a, a lot of companies, yeah, especially in cigars, have have debt. That's not unusual. No, I mean, we, you know, cigar industry is a privately is all private companies, so they don't report earnings. Mm-hmm. And I and I'm you know, so we we don't know what, the, and I don't know what the I don't have any empirical data on what Drew Estate's financials are, other than that they were carrying some debt, particularly when they expanded the factory. They couldn't continue. I mean, so yeah. this may have been a survival move, um, and like I said, Swisher's got an interesting history to it. Um, they're not, you know, the, the the company was founded in 150 or back in 1861, and, and the guy David Swisher got the company as a way of uh, someone owed him money, and that, that's how he got it. So mm-hmm. it, it's there's a, there's an interesting history, and there's a success with this company mm. for the most part. But in the premium cigar space, it's in the recent years there hasn't been that success. So that's mm. Now they've now they've basically brought in one of the top companies, and they have a chance to really do something. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree, yeah. and I strongly encourage people to check out um, cigar-coop.com uh, for more information on this acquisition. Will we're we're running short on time? Did you have a contest you wanted to? We we are all update on the contest. Um, let's just talk quickly about two events we have coming up, November fourteenth, uh, the three year anniversary show. We're going to be broadcasting for most of the day on Friday. Um, and we're going to have a cavalcade of a show <laughs> so uh, in support of Cigar Rights. Absolutely. So we'll be having more information with the schedule with that probably in the next week or two as we start firming up the, the guest slots. Um, and then we can't forget our La Aurora event uh, that we're going to be, I guess we're going to be providing the coverage of it <laughs> is yes. the best way to put it. Yes. Oh, um, I didn't put the link with, It's not our event. It. It's actually Havana Cigar Club's event. So. Yeah. Look for a look for a link. Uh, we'll put it out on social media. So November seventh, December sixth. Yeah, follow us on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, at Sign Stewie Geeks on Twitter. We'll put it out there. Uh, we'll come up with a short link for that, uh, so you can register for that event. You don't want to miss that event. If you're remote, spend the fifty bucks, get in on that. And yeah, check um, out episode one fourteen. We have uh, Todd Lascola from Havana Cigar Club. Yeah. Breaks down everything you're going to get, and it's a, it's a hell of a deal. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. Well, uh, thank you, Will, and thanks, everyone, for listening to this edition of the Stogie Geek Show. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see everyone next week on the Stogie Geek Show.